we have an, an extraordinarily exciting show for you today. This is a topic that we haven't dove into much, if at all, here on the portal. And uh, our guest today is Mr. John Burke. And his story is his, his investigative journey into NDEs began with his own father dying from cancer in the, in the 80s. And John was an agnostic when he first discovered eyewitness NDE accounts in a book in his dad's room. John couldn't help but asking himself, could this be real evidence, even possible proof of God's existence? And welcome to the Paranormal Portal Podcast. I'm your host, Brent Thomas. Thank you all for joining us. And special thank you goes out to all of you who continue to support the podcast and continue to spread the word. Always remember, if any of you out there have experiences of your own that you'd like to share, feel free to email me at paranormalportalradio at gmail.com. Again, paranormalportalradio at gmail.com. And you too could be a guest on the show. three decades, John has studied the commonalities of more than a thousand NDEs from around the globe and is one of the foremost experts in the world in this topic. And this led to him writing his first book, Imagine Heaven, which became a New York Times bestseller and has sold more than a million copies. His new book is out, Imagine the God of Heaven, Near-Death Experiences, God's Revelation, and the Love of you've always wanted. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get right to it. I'd like to introduce to you Mr. John Burke. Thanks John for coming on the show. Hey, thanks Brent for having me on. Excited to be here. Yeah, I I'm, I'm really thrilled as you and I were talking prior to recording. Um this is a topic I've been absolutely fascinated with and and have read several books. Uh, you know, unfortunately I haven't read yours yet, but I'm really excited to because I think NDEs or near death experiences are are probably one of the best evidences we have available to substantiate the whole life after death thing. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, as you talked about, you know, I was I was an agnostic. Um, I, I studied engineering and I worked as an engineer, so that's kind of how my mind works. It's mm-hmm. very analytical, um, and I was agnostic because I had a lot of questions, like. How do you know there's life after death? How do you know this God stuff is real? You know, I, I had heard, you know, growing up here in America, I'd heard, you know, Jesus is the son of God. I was like, well, okay. How do you know? You know, like right. legend happens, right? Right. So that's where I was. And, um, and my dad was dying of cancer. Someone had given him, uh, Moody, Moody's oh. life after life, which was the first research. Um, you know, systematically taken into near death experiences, which, you know, uh, for those who don't know, a, a near death experience is when someone clinically dies, uh, or is very near death. But, but I really focus on death dead, like their heart stops beating, there are no brain waves. And yet modern medicine or miracle, I don't know which mm-hmm. brings them back. Cause sometimes it's after minutes, but sometimes it's after hours. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so we have hospital records of people dead for, you know, hour and 45 minutes, uh, a medical doctor who was dead for 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you have record of this, but when these people come back, they consistently talk about how they were more alive than they've ever felt Yes, in a world more real than this one has ever felt, which is like, what does that mean? Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> In, in a place of, of, of beauty and wonder and mystery and just like, uh, you know, all they can do is use hyperbole mm-hmm. to, to try to explain, um, this, this life to come that, that is similar to ours. No, it's, it's 
not discontinuous to ours, it's continuous to ours, right. but so much more. And, um, and many of them, uh, experience the presence of this God of light and love who is personal, knows him personally. You know, there are all these elements. And, um, and so I, re- I read this book. Uh, I, I couldn't put it down yeah. because I, I was just like, Oh my gosh, maybe this is the evidence I've been looking for. Like I wasn't, you know, so, some people are skeptical, like they don't want to find reason. Sure. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but some people are open skeptics. They're like, Hey, I would love for that to be true, but I just can't, I can't believe it without some reason to believe. And mm-hmm. that was me. Yeah. And, and, and so for me, that opened me up. Now I, I, I stayed pretty skeptical because I, I had a lot of questions. Like I, you know, how do you know this isn't just hallucination or something that happens right. in the brain? They're all, you know, they're all kinds of uh, alternate hypotheses. In fact, in the new book and imagine the God of heaven, I go into the, uh, the, the alternate hypotheses for explaining near death experience and the 10 points of evidence mm-hmm. that convinced me and many ske- skeptical medical doctors that no, this is grounded in reality. This is, this is something that we really ought to take seriously. But at that point, you know, we're talking decades ago. Um, it just opened me to begin to explore, uh, just spiritually explore. I wasn't really, you know, I'd kind of shut it all off. Mm -hmm. And, um, long story short, for the past 35 years, I've studied over a thousand near death experiences. And again, it's kind of how my mind works. I'm, I'm curious and I, and I, I like to take data points and try to put them together in the puzzle, you know, put the puzzle together. And so it's been kind of this, you know, I don't know, call it a bizarre obsession I've had, uh, that, um, you know, that I've wanted to understand what are these near death experiences. And then, you know, for me, it actually ended up leading me to being open to doing things like studying other world religions. I, I read the Bible and I, and I started to see commonalities in what the Bible was saying with what these people were commonly saying. Yeah. And, um, and, and so it led me, it led me to faith in Jesus really through the back door, through near-death experiences, mm-hmm. which isn't the normal, you know, because a lot of Christians kind of push this away. Yeah. Um, and that's that's also why it took me 35 years to write about it, mm-hmm. uh, because I, I actually went from an engineer to become uh, a pastor who started a church for skeptics like me. Oh. Because because I thought, you know, if I had had a place that, you know, the, our our motto was um, no perfect people allowed. Just come as you are and doubters welcome. Mm-hmm. And so we were trying to just create a safe space where, where people here in Austin who were like me, like they weren't closed minded. They were open minded, but they needed a place where it was okay to question, okay to doubt, okay to wonder. Sure. You know, okay for there to be mystery and, you know, well, what about this and what about that? And uh, we found out there are lots of them. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, and, and, and so it took me 35 years to write Imagine Heaven for that reason, because, um, you know, there, there has been a lot of pushback from the Christian community uh, against near death experiences. And so what I was trying to show is that, look, I, I, I mean, I, uh, there, there are about 40 commonalities of, of what these near death experiencers talk about that is common to the life to come. In other words, many people say the same things over and over and over again. And what I'm trying to show is this is actually what God's been telling us all along because it gives everybody incredible hope. Right. And, and we're not talking about, you know, something to fear. We don't need to fear. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's incredibly powerful. Um, just, uh, for the sake of clarity. Um, certainly we've been, we've been led to believe that if our heart stops for a period of minutes, things like brain injury and, and, you know, even if a person was revived, it's believed that there would be, you know, um, problems with their body and with their ability following such a, an extended period of past seven minutes or whatever. And in some of many times that's true. Yeah. But in these cases, that seems to be nullified. Am I correct? I mean, that basically the people that have these extended 
um, well, I don't know, states of dis- of being deceased, they're coming back with with almost no ramifications of that. Is that correct? No, that's not true. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, and 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 you know, one of the things I like to say when people say to me, "Well, like, why couldn't I have an experience like that?" You know, mm. like I would love to have an experience like that, and I'm like. You know, the people I've interviewed almost all have a, a scar right here. Oh, for breathing? <laughs> for a tracheotomy. Yeah. yeah. They, I mean, they went through a brutal recovery coming back. Most mm. of them, they die. And yeah. it's not now, you know, and, and now in some cases they came back. Um, and it was almost like a miraculous healing. I right. mean, uh, you know, this one man, Santosh Akarchi, uh, uh, who is a manufacturing engineer, Indian, a man. Um, and I mean, he had so many things wrong in his body. Uh, his, 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 um, his, uh, gallstones erupted into his pancreas. Oh. And created this elevated heart level. His whole body shut down, organs shut down. You know, he coded and, um, and they put him into an induced coma for three days. He was gone for three days. Well, there were multiple things they didn't think he could survive from. And yet he came back and, and he did. Oh, and, wow. and, and so there, there is, you know, kind of like medically unexplained healing that sometimes happens. But then another one of my friends, you know, like he was in a horrible car accident where a semi truck ran over his car on a bridge and the jaws of life had to cut him out, took 90 minutes Mm -hmm. um, that he had no pulse too during that time because EMS or the, the, the state police had checked his pulse and he was gone and took 90 minutes for them to cut the body out. And then he, and then he comes back. So, but when he came back, I mean, he went through. Oh my gosh. I think it was two years of surgeries of putting his legs back together again and sure. his body just, and so, so no, it's, it's, uh, it's diverse. It's not always simple. It's not always easy. Sure. And, and, and the scope of my question, I guess, was more aimed at brain injury, uh, from the period of, of no pulse and such is, uh, are these people coming back? having to work through a healing process as far as their mental faculties or are they coming back in pretty good shape? Cause I've heard, a, a, in, excuse me. I've heard of one case where I think, and I can't remember the name and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this probably poorly, but I think the guy was dead for like 45 minutes and was brought back and uh, seemed you know, in, in, in contrast to the medical, um, prognosis seemed to rebound incredibly and had no lasting, um, mental problems due to that period of, of no oxygenation of the, of the blood and, and brain and such. Um, yeah. And I would say, uh, two things. So I have interviewed some people who have had severe brain trauma. Okay. From an accident um, or from the actual, um, it could be an accident, um, sure. and, or it could be an accident or like in the case of, uh, Dr. Eben Alexander, who's a Harvard neuroscientist who, who went into a coma in his brain, his neocortex shut down. Yes. Okay. Um, it was, it was menin, meningitis, I believe is what, and, um, it took him a while okay. to get his, his brain memories working again. And, and in some cases of severe trauma to the head, there's mm-hmm. been that. But here's what's interesting, Brent, is that consistently what they tell me is that the memory of the near-death experience is not like a memory you hold in your brain. Mm. It's more like a memory that's in your soul. Wow. And so it's as real. So consistently they'll, they'll start to tell it and they'll tell me they're, it's like they're reliving it. Um, because, because it's not like a memory that fades with time. Mm -hmm. And I've interviewed people, you know, multiple times over, over a decade and their story doesn't change. I mean, in the way they tell it and even the emotion it brings so commonly, um, you know, people who are in, in the presence of God feel so loved. I mean, they, they, they consistently say love is not even a good word for it. Like, 
Yeah, imagine all the love of every person you've ever felt together in one moment times a thousand. You know, they they right. use words like that and they say, sure. and then, you know, when they start talking about it to me again, it will overwhelm their emotions. So they'll start talking about the joy they felt, you know, this mm-hmm. and just ecstasy. And and they'll and they'll start to tear up like they'll it'll overwhelm their emotions. So it's not just a brain based memory. Right. Uh, if the brain is damaged, I think to some degree it can. It, it, I I think in part it shows we are we are we are a soul, a spirit, right, yep. inhabiting a body, mm-hmm. and 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 so we have to use this body, and we are incorporated in this body. You know, the, it's not that the body is bad and the body is nothing, but on the other hand, you know, when the body is damaged, it can damage our ability to, to communicate. Right. But the memory resides for these near death experiencers somewhere deeper, mm-hmm. more like in the soul. That's incredibly profound. cases uh as i said i've i've certainly looked into this phenomena quite a bit mostly in the in the more distant past my distant past but the reluctance of those experiencers to come back cuz uh many times people are said it's not your time you have to go back and and they're like no <laughs> and it's not hard to imagine if you had an opportunity to live in that blissful state of euphoria forever or to come back to, you know, the, the humdrum grinding life that we experience here on earth. And I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, it's, it's horrible, but it's certainly got to be no comparison. Oh, well, like this, this man, Dean Braxton, who, yeah, he's, he's one who has uh, hospital records, an hour and 45 minutes, no heartbeat. Wow. And he came back, but he said, John, when when I came back from being in this place of just so much beauty and wonder and awe and and you know and he he claimed he was in Jesus' presence wow. and he came back and he said um, it was like being put into the toilet. It was like being put into the the dumpster coming back <laughs> in in comparison. Sure, yeah. you know and. Um, and you're right. You know, this world has a lot of wonder and beauty and love and awe and, you know, and I think all of those are, are, are gifts. They're good gifts from God, but it's just this, if indie ears are correct, mm. this life is like a shadow of the real thing to come. Mm. And so all the things we think are so wonderful, you know, uh, they're nothing in comparison to, to what's to come. Yeah. And I, th- I think that these experiences, they, they seem, I mean, some people may critique that and just say it's this or that, but they seem to have purpose in having these experiences. It's not, the, these don't seem like random events. Um, I've often thought maybe this is, a message from the divine or God or, or whatever that don't worry. It's all okay. Everything will be fine. You oh, know, I absolutely believe that. I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to show yeah. in both imagine heaven uh, and in imagine the God of heaven that I absolutely believe that these are gifts from God, mm-hmm. people coming back, or a purpose. And I mean, many times he tells them that I want you to tell people, yeah, tell them how much I love them. Tell them there's hope. Tell them there's forgiveness. You know, I mean, he says stuff like that. So, um, but you know, maybe backing up for a second. Sure. Because I, I start to think about the skeptic I was right. Mm -hmm. You know, because, because the, uh, a lot of people will say these, Near death experiences are just hallucination or they're just, um, anoxia, you know, a lack of oxygen to the brain as, as you're dying or, um, it's, it's just, it's a trick the brain plays while we're passing as endorphins are flooding the brain, you know, one last hurrah attempt at keeping us alive. 
And it's just a way of easing our passing. Hmm. Um, or like Dr. Michael Shermer, skeptic, um, you know, says now he says, well, it's, it's what happens when the brain's rebooting. So as it's coming back online, um, none of those fit the evidence. And, and in chapter two of, of this new book, Imagine the God of Heaven, I go through the 10 points of evidence that convince me as a skeptical engineer, but also have convinced many skeptical medical doctors who have then published in 900 prestigious journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association, The Lancet, Europe's most prestigious, uh, you know, medical journal, psychology, uh, psychiatry. I mean, across the board. And, you know, just, just to give you a few of them, if you, if you're still skeptical about this, that, that we should pay attention to these near death experiences. You know, one thing that really got my attention when I was still skeptical was that when people initially die, they say they leave their bodies, but they still have a body. They have a spiritual body. They're themselves. In fact, many say more themselves than they've ever been. And, not with five senses, more like 50 senses, Mm. you know? So it's it's like superpowers, (laughs) you know, it's kind of hard to believe and yet it's consistent, but commonly initially they're still in the room where their body is being resuscitated. Mm -hmm. And that's really critical because then when they come back, they're able to make observations that can either be verified or, or proved false. And you know, a, a couple of examples um, in in this new book, uh, Imagine the God of Heaven. There's a woman in London, Mary, who gives she she dies giving birth, um, and I think this is in the 90s. So they still had ceiling fans in in hospitals. She leaves her body. She observes what's going on with them working quickly to try to you know get her back alive because she had coded. Um, she travels to this place again of incredible beauty and is in the presence of this God of light and love who tells her, you, you have to go back. And, and she begs, don't make me go back. I want to stay. <laughs> mm. And, uh, that, that always fascinates me. How many of these people argue with God? And I, <laughs> I, I personally, I love that because like, sure. it's just like so real and yet we can so be ourselves and, Consistently, he says this, and he, and he and he said he said to her, "You know, you still have a purpose on Earth, and your son is going to live, and he's going to need you." Hmm. And you know, she was she was dying, giving birth to to her son, and and so anyway, as she's coming back to her body, she passes through the ceiling and notices a red sticker on the top side of the ceiling fan. She comes to. She, as, as is common, is trying to describe to all the medical personnel this amazing experience. And I, you know, I saw God and I saw what you guys were doing and, but, and they're just like, Oh, you know, how old I'll give her a shot of antipsychotic <laughs> drug. Sure. And she finally cornered this one nurse and told her the things she said and, and movement she did and what she did and, and got the nurse's attention. And she said, look, I'll prove to you this is real. Go get a ladder and look on the top side of the ceiling fan. There's a red sticker, and here's what it says. And the nurse gets an orderly and gets help and does look, and sure enough, red sticker that said exactly what she thought, <laughs> what she what she had said. Now, you could say, well, that's a one-off, you know, but those have been published, mm-hmm. like in The Lancet. Um, Dr. Pim Van Lommel, who I've interviewed, he is a cardiologist in Holland and he published in the Lancet a case of a man coming in under cardiac arrest. He was comatose. So he was, he was dead and they, they were going to shock him. They didn't know how long he had been dead. He was found in a park hmm. and the nurse found dentures. So had to take the dentures out, put them in the lower drawer of the crash cart so that they could intubate him and then shock him. They got his heart going in the ER, but he never came to. They move him to another room, and a week later, he comes to, and he's complaining about not having his dentures. And then in the hallway, he sees a nurse, and he says, that nurse, that get that nurse. That nurse knows where my dentures are. 
and he, he, he describes you put them, you took them out and put them in the cart with all the bottles on it. And they go and sure enough, that's where they found it. And he described all the personnel in the ER who looked like what, who did what, yet he had never been, um, you know, he, 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 he had been brain dead and, uh, and had never been, um, conscious during that time. Now, here's the crazy thing is that Dr. Janice Holden actually did a study on near-death experiencers who claim to make verifiable observations. So ones that could then be checked out and, you know, each one could make 10 observations, right? Mm -hmm. And she interviewed 93 near-death experiencers. And what she found is of of the many observations that they made, 92% were verified as completely accurate. Wow. 92%. Another 6% of, you know, each one's many observations were mostly accurate. Only 2% were inaccurate. And that turned out to be one person who was probably making it up. Oh. (laughs) So you got, so think about this. You have verifiable observations that can be confirmed by third parties, doctors and others in the room that grounds these experiences in our reality as well. Mm Mm-hmm. But not only that, when, when people die who are born blind, when they have a near death experience, they can see. Yes. And so in, in Imagine the God of Heaven, I interviewed three people who were blind and they see the same thing. So like Debbie, um, described she, she dropped dead on her, she had a, a seizure mm-hmm. after she was burned, had a seizure drops on her bathroom floor. She's up above when her mom hears and rushes in. When she comes to, she's able to tell her mom what she looked like and what she was wearing. And she said, you were, you were wearing a bathrobe and it was dark. And she said, yeah, I was wearing my black bathrobe. (laughs) And, and, um, then Debbie also travels through this tunnel to this place, this world of light and, and, and beauty. And there, um, she also encounters God who, who tells her she must go back. She's going to have children. She'd been told she couldn't have children. She comes back. She does have children. Uh, she also meets her grandmother. So this is another commonality of meeting deceased loved ones. Her grandmother had died when she was an infant. So she never knew her grandmother. Oh. She meets her grandmother. And when she comes back, she describes to her mother what her grandmother looked like. You know, brown hair, how tall she was, what what she looked like. And her mom said, yes, that's right. Except that's what she looked like when she was 30. Hmm. Well, that's, that's another commonality is that indie ears say people on the other side are typically in their prime. Sure. Not not too young or old. This is, you know, <laughs> typically about, about 29, 30 ish. And so so you've got verifiable observations. You have blind people. Who, who see things. You have people like Debbie who also meet unknown deceased people, mm-hmm. uh, and can describe them. Like I, I've interviewed people and have cases of, of children who died and came back saying they met their sibling on yes. the other side and their parents would say, well, you don't, you don't have a sister. And they insisted, I met my, my sister. And then the parents realized, oh my gosh, we had a miscarriage. Yeah. We never told you about that. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so, you know, th- that's just three of the 10 points of evidence that alternate theories don't make sense of, of these 10 points of evidence. They're just throwing spaghetti at the wall yeah. and hoping that something other than our our soul survives our bodily death mm-hmm. can make sense of this but honestly i think many times that's that's just um you know that's wanting to believe something against the evidence not with the evidence i would agree with you and and i you know as you and i were talking uh prior and we alluded to it a little bit earlier but there do seem to be those individuals that, and I'm, I'm sure it must be due to their own personal paradigm, but they just, they need for this not to be real. Like it, it be in, because perhaps it threatens them. Perhaps it's a, an affront to the hubris and, and arrogance that these 
you know, very scientific minds. And, and I don't mean to say that in a disparaging way, because of course, not all scientific minds are, are opposed to the possibility, but for those that do, and they seem to need to exercise that skepticism and that uh, abject dismissal. Uh, yeah. and, and, and to me, it's, it's such an ugly thing because it attacks the beauty and the hope of what these represent. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And, and look, it's, it's true of all of us. I mean, you know, we all, we all have what's called a noetic web of, you know, we, we take our, all our data points and we all put together a framework or a mm. worldview of how to make sense of who am I? Why am I here? Why did these things happen to me? You know, is there a God or not? What's he like? You know, how do I, how do I succeed in life or how do I make something of my life? You know, how do I get loved? How do I know I'm valuable? All these questions and, and we're all trying to answer them and trying to create a, a sense of our place in this world and security. Mm-hmm. So you can't blame anybody for that. We sure. all do it. And nobody knows everything. Um, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, and so the difficulty of that is we, we create a framework that explains things to us and keeps us feeling secure. Sure. When that, especially our core framework, when it begins to be tested, it's threatening yes. because what it's threatening is our very security. Yeah. Now it doesn't have to though. And, 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 and that's one of the things that, you know, in, in our, uh, you know, like I told you, I, I started a church for skeptics. So mm-hmm. one of the things I would, I would often say is, you know, be skeptical. It's good to be skeptical. Ask mm-hmm. questions. You know, doubt is not the opposite of, of faith. Um, the opposite of faith is a lack of trust. Hmm. And the truth is we all have to trust something. It, it might be, I trust myself, you know, I'll figure it out myself. Okay. Hmm. Well, you're God then good luck. <laughs> um, it might be, I trust science hmm. and I have talked to scientists who are like, you know, well, um, sure. There are all these points of, of, of evidence. So, you know, one of them is the anthropic principle. I was, I was, I was writing on this just recently because, you know, the, the full solar eclipse went in my backyard. Oh, okay. And, and it's fantastic. You know, it's like such an amazing thing. Well, what most people don't know is that there are about a hundred constants of nature that are so finely tuned. So, uh, you know, imagine a control panel with a hundred knobs. And if one knob is tuned plus or minus one or two percent, just one knob, humans couldn't exist on planet Earth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we're, we're talking about things as like the gravitational force mm-hmm. minus or plus a little bit. We couldn't exist. The weak and strong nuclear force, you know, what, what quantum mechanics is, you know, that the holds the atoms together plus or minus a percent. But what uh, people don't know is the moon, its mass and its distance from the sun to the earth also plus or minus, hmm. and we wouldn't be able to exist here. It stabilizes our axis so that we don't burn to death and freeze to death in the summer and, and winter. Sure. Um, that's not true on other planets. And so when you saw that full solar eclipse, I mean, the moon, the, the sun is 400 times bigger than the earth. Sure. But it also happens to be four, the sun happens to be 400 times further away. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly why it can fully eclipse. Mm-hmm. And so there, there are things like that, you know, that, that scientists will look at and you can say one of two things, you know, for me, I look at it and the evidence, cause there's lots of other evidence, the evidence points to a, a creator who has a mind that designed. Yeah. Yeah. But scientists can look at it and they have and say, well, actually maybe there are an infinite number of universes, parallel universes. And ours just happens to be the one with a hundred knobs turned that way Mm. there. Okay. That really might be, I don't have that much faith. Right. <laughs> like that doesn't make much sense to me, but if sure. you want to take a giant leap of faith, 
away from evidence. Uh, because, because, and here, and here's why, Brent. If there weren't evidence that God has actually communicated, and NDEs are one of those, mm-hmm. but in my books, I trace how God has communicated through history. And it actually proved to me there really is a God because he said, here's what I'm going to do. And I, and we have proof that it was written down before it happened. And then it happened in history. And we're talking about massive national events that you can't explain. I've never heard anybody explain that away. Wow. And so, so you have points of evidence in history where God says, and, and, and by the way, this same God of light and love, same God. And, and, um, who, who says, I am the God of all nations and he's doing something through nations for the sake of all people of all nations because he intended all people to be his children. Mm-hmm. That's, that's his intent. And, and so then, you know, uh, and, and by the way, I use his, but sure. not a him or a her. Right. Uh, you know, and I write about that and imagine the God of heaven that, you know, we are created male and female in God's image, but he's not God, male or female. Yeah. Um, but, but not only that, then you have modern near death experiences by the millions. And this is another point of evidence. 48% of indie ears encounter this God of light and, and love, um, who's not a force, an impersonal force, but a personal being and even enjoyable. I mean, words that we fun, funny, but also a, a a power that, you know, like this one, um, this one, uh, uh, neurologist who was stabbed 13 times by a, he's a psychiatrist as well. And, and a patient went psychotic and stabbed him 13 times. And he said, time stood still right before the 14th and boom, there in front of him is this God of light brighter than the sun. He said, imagine standing five feet away from the source of a nuclear explosion. Hmm. He said, that's what it was like. And he said, the power was just immense and just roiling with energy. And he said, but, but what was roiling with energy even more was the love. And, and as soon as he said that, he chokes up. You know, that's like one of those that they just can't even talk about it without it just overwhelming them. You know, and he's, and he said these nine qualities instantly imprinted, uh, on, on his soul. These, these qualities of God, um, infinite love, infinite knowledge, kindness, kinder than a thousand times the kindest person you've ever known. He said, Hmm. um, humor. He said, you don't expect God to show up ready to laugh his ass off. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, but there was, there was a, and it wasn't like he was joking, but it was like this quality of, of, uh, of lightheartedness, but mm-hmm. also a purity. And, and he said, um, and a humility. He said, you know, if I had the qualities and I didn't go into all of them, he said, I would be so proud. Mm. He says, he's not. He's humble. Yeah. And, and, you, and you know, you hear things like that and, and you're like, okay, how do you put all that together? This <laughs> all powerful being that creates the universe and yet is so loving and kind and humble even, but enjoyable. And, mm-hmm. and you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to show people is like, God wants to be known. Because God created us for love. Mm-hmm. And, and that is consistently what indie ears come back saying. You know, another commonality is they have a life review. Cool. In the presence of, of, of God, they have a life review. Um, and they come back saying two things. Certain God is love and how we love or treat one another is what he showed me in my life review. That's what matters most. Hmm. Oh, but I, I, I missed my point. I got off. <laughs> so 48% of these indie ears encounter this God and from every culture and, and from every religious background. Mm-hmm. But why? 
like if it's just in the brain, then it should, it should meet cultural expectations. Sure. But, but it doesn't, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, so what I'm trying to show is like, there is, there is history to this God. There is current medical science. I think it's scientific evidence. You know, principle of science is what is consistently observed is real. Mm-hmm. Well, when you have thousands and thousands of millions having these experiences, but thousands saying, I encountered the same God, that's evidence. Mm-hmm. That's great. And especially when the evidence is not expected. Right. So when you have agnostics or atheists, you know, I interviewed an atheist tenured college professor who said he had a hellish experience and cried out to Jesus and Jesus rescued him. And he comes back and leaves his tenured professorship to become a Christian pastor. How do you explain that? Wow. Well, that's, that brings up a great point because, um, there are those that experience the opposite of the blissful euphoric experience. And how often did you run into that? Yeah. Well, um, so in some studies, uh, those who come forward, to share their near death experience, 23% of them come forward sharing a hellish, oh. what they would call a hellish near death experience. Mm-hmm. And, and so I write, I, I devoted, you know, a whole chapter in Imagine Heaven to talking about that. I mean, the other 22 chapters are, <laughs> are about the amazing, wonderful, sure. uh, experience to come, but I didn't, it's, it's, it's not fair to the, to the data or to the reality of what they report to not also recognize that a lot report these hellish near death experiences. Yeah. What's fascinating, Brent is, you know, I have a friend here in, in Austin, um, who he had, a, he overdosed on cocaine mm. and, um, you know, and he and his, he and his, his wife, um, you know, they had, I mean, they'd been in everything. She was a stripper and they were in, involved in cartels and oh, yeah, you know, all kinds of stuff. And he overdosed his own cocaine and he is falling. He said, he said, I was instantly sober and I'm falling through this blacker than black darkness. And he said, I knew where I was going Oof. and he started making excuses. He was like, wait, I'm a good person. I've never murdered anybody. And I've never, and, and, and the more justification he said he made, the faster he was dropping. Hmm. until finally he just cried out, God, forgive me, help me, God, help me. That's all he said. Mm -hmm. He didn't stop falling, but he said this presence was there with him. And he asked him, Paul, what have you done with the life I gave you? Hmm. And then boom. And and now again, on the other side, near-death experiences say time doesn't work the same way. Okay. Some say there is no time, but some say, no, there was time, but there was all the time or there was the past, present and the future all in one moment. It's it's hard to explain. Well, you know, I point out that one of Jesus disciples, Peter says that exact same thing. He says to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Mm -hmm. So I talk about two dimensional and three dimensional time and how, how that would work and how near death experiencers are actually describing what would be like two dimensional time. Oh. And, and so they have a life review. So Paul has a life review and relives his whole life like that, but re-experiencing every bit of it. Hmm. And, and in it, you know, and he realized, and this is common too, is you realize the truth. Like there's no hiding from the truth. And, and they will commonly say, God was not judging me. God was loving me unconditionally, but he wanted me to see. Yeah. And he said, I was the hard one on myself. And I think these, these, these life reviews are, you know, honestly, I think they are, um, an opportunity because these people all come back and they're going to come back. Right. But they are, they're also an opportunity to learn that, that, you know, what God said to us, through Jesus is true. It's like God is a forgiving God. Mm-hmm. He's not, he's not a hold, hold your sins and your wrongs against you. 
I mean, he claims that what he did on the cross through Jesus was to pay for all people's wrongs for all, all time, past, present, even your future ones. Sure. Which is astounding. Mm-hmm. But that's what indie ears experience. Hmm. That even watching their life review in the presence of this God, they feel incredible love. They feel forgiven. And, and in Paul's case, he, you know, boom, he comes to in the ER and he told, he told his girlfriend, I don't know what you're going to do, but I've got to figure out who this God was that just saved me. Wow. And he did. And he actually is the, he's the pastor of the largest Hispanic church in Austin now just sharing his, his story and, and, you know, uh, and what he did. So interestingly, the three, um, the three people who had hellish experiences that I personally know <laughs> became pastors when they came back. <laughs> and, 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 and here's another important thing, not because of how horrible hell was, right? But consistently because of how wonderful the God who rescued them when they cried out to him was. Sure. So, and I think that's really important. There used to be a program that was used for at-risk youth, and it was called Scared Straight. And uh, generally, they would bring kids to this, you know, the prison life and have these, uh, you know, life lifelong inmates come up and, and intimidate and scare them just to say, hey, you know, this is the path you're on. And this this seems like like that kind of intervention, but uh, but it didn't focus. I mean, obviously, the people knew they were in trouble. They could feel that what was happening was not good. And, but yet there was a, there was a redemption arc in this for them. They were in, 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 it was their opportunity to start over and to, you know, to remap their, their, their course. Yeah. And, and, you know, like, like Howard Storm, the atheist professor, um, told me, he said, you know, m- most everybody has to hit rock bottom before they look up. Yeah. It's a common, you know, recovery notion. Is, yeah. you know, we, and, and interestingly, you know, cause I've worked a lot in recovery mm-hmm. and, um, in, in, in recovery, uh, you know, they even talk about how our addiction at the core was not addiction to alcohol or meth or cocaine or whatever. It's addiction to self. Sure. And that's why the first step is I'm powerless to fix mm-hmm. this on my own. Mm-hmm. And then come to believe in a God who is a, a power higher than myself who can help me. So it's, it's, it's transferring from me being God to there's another God who can help me. But all that to say is Howard said to me, you know, I, I guess I, that's, that had to be my rock bottom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I knew, you know, it was, uh, you know, it, it, it really took this hellish experience to finally look up and cry out to God. Yeah. Well, that's, and it's amazing. And and I think that these experiences, uh, again, much like you've already shared, I mean, they're meant to be shared because I think the, the, the prevailing message is that, look, there is a purpose to all this. This isn't just a, you know, we're not just uh, groups of, of, you know, biological cells and we, with some abject consciousness bouncing through this physical world that we're so much more and we're connected to so much more. And I, and I think if anything, these, these, these experiences and these messages are incredibly empowering and, and incredibly comforting, you know, and, and I'm, I'm really thrilled that you've you know, that you've championed this work and that you're doing this work because I think we need to be reminded maybe I don't I haven't lived through all of time but I just know that certainly things feel really heavy right now and uh there's a yeah. lot of people hurting and angry and and confused and frustrated and and I think messages like this are incredibly timely because we need to remember that this world is, is only a small part of our experience and our potential and that 
there's so much more that we need to focus on. And uh, I think, well, and I'll tell you, Brent, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the consistent messages um, that people come back with from this near death experience, and especially in imagine the God of heaven, you know, I've got Santosh who was this Hindu manufacturing engineer, Bibi who is in Tehran who has a, a heart attack. Heidi, who is a Jewish girl who, who grew, grows up with an abusive father telling her, there is no God, your life is worthless. Jesus, the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. And yet all three of them um, come back having met this same God who in his presence, one of the consistent things they say is, you know, I, I knew this couldn't be true, but I felt like I was the special one. I felt like I was the only one he loved. Like of the 7 billion people, like he loved me most. And this one guy, Dean Braxton, said to me, and then, you know, I felt that and I thought, how could that be? And I thought, I started thinking about my wife. And then I saw that, no, he loves her like she's the only one that he loves. And then he thought about someone else. And he said, every single person, he realized God creates a love that is unique to you. Mm. And that's why I subtitled the book, The Love You've Always Wanted. Because what they consistently say is that of all the beauty of heaven, and I mean, it's spectacular. We're talking, you know, mountains and forests and trees and flowers and plants, but, but vivid and colors beyond our color spectrum and adventure, you know, like Heidi, that Jewish girl who uh, was told Jesus was a hoax when her horse lands on her and she dies, she's up 30 feet in the air. And, you know, she always believed in God, always prayed to God. Um, despite her dad, she turns and looks and there's Jesus floating hmm. with her 30 feet up. And, and she said, I wasn't shocked. Like what's a good Jewish girl like me doing with Jesus? I'm not supposed to be with Jesus. <laughs> she said, no, I knew him. This was the God I had prayed to my whole life. Hmm. Well, he takes her hand. He shows her her life review. And he shows her, you know, all these things she'd been through. And then he takes her hand and gets a big grin on his face. Now, she's a 16-year-old girl who who loves speed. She loves bareback, horseback riding, you know, that's and that's how she died. Mm-hmm. And they take off. And she said it was like, it was like Superman and Lois Lane, just like through our atmosphere out into outer space and like at the speed of light. And she said, it was the funnest thing I've ever <laughs> done in my life. Wow. To this point. Now, you know, a lot of people like they don't, they don't get it. Like no, that can't be God and God can't be fun. Mm-hmm. And I like to point out to people like, you know, the very last thing Jesus said, on earth to, to his closest friends the night before his crucifixion. He said, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you Mm. and your joy would overflow. He's the God of all joy. He created us to enjoy. The only reason we love anything about life, the only reason we have pleasures in life is because our creator created us to be able to. Yeah. And so why in the world would we think that the life to come you know, this life is broken. There, like you said, is entropy. <laughs> yeah. You know, everything goes to chaos and disorder and disease and, and, and famine and, you know, and hatred and hurt and all these things. Mm-hmm. Why would we think this life that is corrupted would be less than the life that God says we are destined for? Sure. Which, which is going to be free of that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important because I think that's the point of this life. You know, this is a temporary existence. Yeah. That's, it's temporal. Yeah. So only for 70, 80 years, we experience the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. Mm-hmm. We experience what life is like, you know, the way God intended it to be with love and kindness and, you know, acceptance and, and, and beauty and, art and creativity and adventure and wonder and all those great things. And then we also experience hatred and hurt and, and we are all in it. I mean, we hurt mm-hmm. each other even when we're intending to love. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. But what we're learning, I think, is that love is absolute. That love is the point. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's what, um, you know, that's, that's what the Jewish prophet Moses said is the first and most important commandment is to love God. And the second is to love your neighbor mm-hmm. as yourself. Jesus comes along and says the same thing. Yep. Um, it's called, you know, it's, it's often called the golden rule and it's found in every religious text of every culture too. Yeah. Um, it's universal. Yep. And so I think that's what God is trying to teach us is how to reconnect to the source of love. Who loves us is not set out to condemn us, but to forgive us and, and walk with us to be able to better love one another. And personally, Brent, I think in our age of digital global communication, um, you know, he's raising up these testimonies all over the globe. I couldn't have interviewed 70 people on every continent. Sure. You know, a, a Muslim in Tehran, uh, uh, you know, an imam in, in Rwanda. They're all in my book in, in Imagine the God of Heaven. And, uh, and they come back saying, you know, God is the, the healing. He, he is the source of love that we need to reconnect to so that instead of just dividing and hating each other for differences, he wants us to unite. Yeah. And I think that's a real powerful part of what you're saying is that, you know, with your, with your unique experience of talking to these very disparate backgrounded people, but yet there's such a commonality in it, you know, regardless of, of observed religion and, and, uh, you know, other practices culturally and such that no matter where the people are, are experiencing these things, they're still experiencing these same events. And, and that to me is, is really beautiful because I think one of, the, one of the things that seems to be, uh, a constant in our history is that our, our, our pursuits of divine understanding or religion actually become uh, exclusive and excluding and create divisions. And that just seems so contrary to the purpose well, and, of reaching yeah, that divine it, awareness. It is. Yeah, it is. And I like to, I like to remind people that, um, you know, it was the religious leaders of Jesus day who crucified Jesus in the name of protecting God. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And, and, and so, yes, like, um, we can all, and, and I'm, I put myself in the same camp. We can all be deceived. Mm-hmm. Um, we can all do things, you know, in the name of God, that's really just to protect ourselves or to, you know, protect our turf or our power or our prestige, sure. you know, and that's exactly what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in, instead, I think the way of, of truly, um, spiritual growth is humility. Yeah. Is, is we've got to be able to, it doesn't mean we don't know anything or we don't hold to anything, but we're able to stay centered in the core of what we know and, and, and believe and can hold on to while also thinking about other things and how does that incorporate or not? Yeah. You know, well, it's, it's, it's an incredible, journey and and like I said I'm looking forward to getting a hold of your books and and checking them out as well because this is a topic that that I think is absolutely fascinating and empowering and and beautiful and the message is I think it resonates with all of us that we we want to be loved we want to experience that love and to know that that love is there you know so John it's been an, and then, you know and and I would I would say one last thing is sure. that um Another consistent message is that God is with you mm-hmm. and no one gets you better. Yeah. I mean, there's no one else who's been through every high and every low and actually cares and has compassion on you. And that is a consistent message of these indie ears. Yeah. You know, and so there's, you know, some, so many people, and this was me, you know, like, I, quite honestly, like there was a part of me that didn't want there to be a God, um, because I was afraid he would ruin my plans for my life. Mm. You know, I thought he was bad. <laughs> and, uh, and I think a lot of people have that kind of fear. 
And so I think what, what these stories tell us and what I'm trying to show is that, you know, those fears are unfounded. And in fact, what, what really can come is a new sense of freedom, right? A new sense of rootedness in, man, you know what? Uh, I am unique and I'm supposed to be unique. I don't have to prove myself to everyone. I don't have to be like everyone. I am loved where I am for who I am. And I have unique things to offer the world Mm -hmm. and I can fulfill my unique purpose. And, and that matters. And I think all those messages are, are, they're true to the Bible and they're true to what indie ears are saying, but they also are so applicable to the way we can live our lives with greater joy and peace and compassion and understanding for others. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I do think that's what our world needs right now. Amen. I, I'm with you, brother. Uh, let's, let's hope that your message gets out there far and wide. And, uh, a lot of people pick up this book because I, you know, I think this is medicine for the soul in a lot of cases. And, and, uh, just to know again, we're not alone. And, uh, I, I want to thank you very sincerely for coming on the show and talking with us today. And could you take a couple minutes to keep people abreast of how to follow you, where to find your published works and, and et cetera? Yeah. I mean, imagine heaven or imagine the God of heaven and they're on Amazon or, you know, Costco and Walmart and anywhere books are sold pretty much. So any, any, anywhere you want to look, um, imagine heaven.net is a website that you can go to for more information on uh, my writing research. And, uh, and, and then, yeah, the, the, the church I started is gatewaychurch.com and I've done messages that are out there and, and it's, it's gateway church, Austin, there are other gateway churches, so okay. you can get confused and that's not us. <laughs> um, but if you go out there, there are messages I've done where you can see the interviews, me interviewing these people, oh, um, a lot of them as well. And so if you want to, if you want to check that out. Well, it's, it's an amazing journey, brother. And, uh, I'd love to have you back and we can dive yeah, even read, further into this. Read, read one or both the books and there's so much more to talk about. It's amazing. All right. Well, thank you, John, for making the time today. It's been an absolute pleasure, sir. Well, thanks, Brent. Get out. guys thank you so much for joining us here on tonight's show i hope you guys enjoyed it please feel free to follow us on facebook facebook.com slash paranormal portal radio as well as finding us on twitter we're on twitter at paranormal portal p-o-r-t-l and uh, we'd love to have you stop by our youtube page and subscribe and check out our shows there we got hundreds of shows journeys into the paranormal portal so i hope you'll check it out check it out guys we're over there at youtube.com slash paranormal portal so Hope to see you guys soon. Uh, we'll be back, of course, for more podcasts in the coming days. So we love you all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other. Help each other out. Find the magic in every day. And remember to laugh as much as you can. Bye.